Take your Bibles, remain standing if you're able. Turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Let's get into the Word this morning while it's still morning. Go to verse 16, 1 Chronicles, Old Testament, chapter 21, verse 16. If you're all there, say, woo! All righty. You ready? New King James Version. On your marks? Get set. Go. Then David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, having in his hand a drawn sword and stretched out over Jerusalem. So David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell on their faces. And David said to God, Was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? I am the one who sinned and done evil indeed. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, O Lord my God, be against me and my father's house. But do not, but not against, pardon me, your people, that they should be plagued. Verse 18. Therefore the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So David went up at the word of Gad, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. And now Ornan turned and saw the angel, and his four sons who were with him hid themselves. But Ornan, who didn't have the fear of God, Ornan continued threshing wheat. Can you imagine continuing to work while an angel is ready to slay you? His sons had sense. Verse 21. So David came to Ornan, and Ornan looked and saw David, and he went out from the threshing floor and bowed before David with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, Grant me this place, the threshing floor, that I might build an altar on it to the Lord. And you shall grant it to me at the full price that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. But Ornan said to David, Take it yourself. And let my lord the king do whatever is good in his eyes. Look, I also give you the oxen for burnt offering, the threshing implements for wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I give it all. And the king David said to Ornan, No, but I will surely buy it for the full price, for I will not take that, pardon me, I will not take what is yours for the Lord, or nor offer burnt offerings with that which costs me nothing. So David gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold, which is about 400 plus thousand dollars. Interesting, considering our challenge with our building today. By weight of the, of, of, the, of the place, verse 26. And David built an altar there to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire in the altar of the burnt offering. So the Lord commanded the angel and he returned his sword to its sheath. It's always good when the angel of the Lord puts his sword away. Verse 28, at that time, David saw that the Lord had answered him on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. He sacrificed there for the tabernacle of the Lord and the altar of the burnt offering, which Moses had made in the wilderness, were at that time at the high place of Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of God, for he was afraid of the sword of the angel of the Lord. Verse 1 of chapter 22, our final verse. Then David said, This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of burnt offering for Israel. Let's pray. Father, we thank and praise you for what you did in the first service. What a powerful service we had. And now we sense your presence and your power, your unction and your anointing. God, I pray, be upon all of our ears, giving us ears to hear and hearts to respond. Upon me and these lips of clay to preach and it would burn faith in the hearts of each and every one that is under the sound of my voice. I ask, Holy Spirit, give us living understanding. Release all that's in your heart. Let the gifts of the Spirit be in operation, Lord, today, even as never before. We thank you and praise you that you have ordained this moment in time. You have set us in time right now at this place with a brief moment we call life. And God, I pray that you would deposit from heaven into our lives today. And may we never be the same and the effects of this service be far-reaching even to eternity. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. We do have notes for you and they're coming around. What a tremendous time we've had already this weekend. We had our, our men's uh, breakfast, which meets 
on the first Saturday of every month, and we'd encourage you to be a part of that if you're a man. And it was outstanding uh, as we gathered together and uh, ate bacon and all other kinds of man food and uh, had a tremendous time. Hank Hergelot leads our men's ministry along with some others. We appreciate you, Hank, and all the hard work that you did. Amen. In Ezekiel chapter 22, and uh, why don't you turn there, Ezekiel 22, find verse 30. I'll read that in just a moment. Let me encourage you to go ahead and register to be a part of the prophetic conference. You want to register. It is filling up. It will fill. It will close, and we will not allow anybody else to come. We have a limitation of about 500 people that can be a part of that conference, and it'll close at that point. So if you wait to the last minute or register at the door, it'll be too late. So if you go ahead and do that, that'll help secure your, your, your place at that prophetic conference. What a time of training, impartation, and hearing the word of the Lord individually over your life. All of the prophets coming from literally around the world uh, to minister to us on that weekend of um, uh, February 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th also happens to be Valen Valentine's Day. Hint, hint to all the husbands, Valentine's Day. Okay. Ezekiel 22, find verse 30. It says, For I sought for a man among them who would make up a wall, who stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. In actual fact, I believe that the abyss, now I'm just going to make a statement, I'll back it later, maybe Wednesday. I believe the abyss has been opened and that plagues are actually being released in the earth right now. And, and there actually is a, a, a coronavirus and I don't know what will happen with all of that. You know, you've heard of pandemics and bird flu and different things. The truth is that there is, a, there is a, a wicked assignment of darkness all over the earth. But we have been placed at this time in history to bring in effect change. We have been called as a people, the people of God, to stand in the gap. What does that mean? That when a, a wall, a city without walls, in fact, it was a scripture I memorized long ago when I had an anger problem. I've been set free, mostly. Amen. A, like a man who gives full vent to his wrath is like a city without walls. A city that had no walls would be open to marauders, would be open to anybody to come in and do anything to that city they wanted to. So ancient cities had walls. So if there's a hole in the wall, that would be a gap. And to, for somebody to make up the hedge or come up and, and, and stand in the gap is a picture of somebody standing between life in the city and death outside the city. Somebody would stand with a sword in their hand, and I'm saying spiritually speaking, to declare the glory of God in this hour. There is such a need for people to rise in their God-given, blood-bought right and to declare the truth of God's word in the highways and byways and the high places of our nation. And I'm so blessed that God has called us as kings, cathedral and chapels, one church around the world to do just that. We're not here to play patty cake for Jesus. We're here to preach the good news of Jesus to see every man, every woman, every child be set free from the yoke of bondage to be filled with his spirit and to fulfill the plan and destiny that God had for you before you were in, even in your mother's womb. And I don't know how much time we have, but so help me, God, with all the power that works within me. I'm going to do my part and fire you up to do yours and equip you to do yours. We are standing on the very precipice of the close of all time. And our church has been placed here along with every other church, whether they realize it or not, as a remnant, as a people to stand in the gap and to declare the truth of God's word. I was so grieved at, as a candidate. Now I start talking about, somebody say, are you going to get political? Yeah, I, I do. Um, you know, because I'm going to stand on God's word, so apparently that's political these days. You stand on God's word and preach against abortion, same-sex marriage, and all of that, then, you know, you get controversial, so call it what you want. I can't help, but I'll stand before the judge of all at the end to give an account for how I've believed and how I've taught you. I, was, I, I put a post up, a retweet on, on my uh, Twitter account, and one of the candidates literally said this. They literally said this. I mean, I had to watch it. Did, they, did she just say that? She said, if I'm elected president, then I am going to pick a, and I'm paraphrasing, but you can go look at it. I'm going to have a, a young transsexual make the decision on who's going to be the Department of Education head so that we can make laws and decisions and money. And so I'm, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's not far off from what I'm telling you. It's almost exactly the same. So that we can put the Department of Education to have a, I don't know what it is, a welcoming community. 
And I almost threw up. In fact, I did in my own mouth, spiritually speaking. Listen, we love people, but you, if you don't call sin, sin, you have somebody in the Department of Education, they're only, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble right now. They're already teaching that reparative, they already teach that reparative therapy is illegal in California. You know what that is? That somebody who's been trapped in homosexuality wants to get free, and they go through a thing called reparative therapy. And they get set free from that and then begin to, begin to live a life of freedom and, and, and instead of torment. And, uh, and that's outlawed in California. Listen, if you don't stand up right now, if you, you don't stand up now and we start making a difference right now, it's already late in the hour. But if we don't stand up right now, then pedophilia would be, is going to be sanctioned as a sexual preference and as normal that you would then, it is not normal, it's very abnormal and demonic that you would then have a sexual preference for children. It's already happening. It's already happening. He said, well, don't be political. Well, for God's sake, who's going to say something? I am. I'm going to say something. I Just look at your neighbor and say, well, it's so great to be in church today. We're making up a hedge. We're going to make a difference. I said, we're going to make a difference. He's looking for a man. He's looking for a people who would do that. And uh, I, for one, am saying, me and my house will serve the Lord no matter what comes. Amen. You can take the 501c3 and do whatever you like with it. We're going to preach the truth of God's word. They changed their mind on it. It doesn't matter. Amen. The opinions of this pastor are not necessarily that of Dr. James Morocco. So we'll just put that as a little addendum, just in case. Okay, praise God. He stands for righteousness. I just, I'm not sure he wants to give up the 501c3. Anyway, what are we talking about, Pastor Karen? Ezekiel standing in the gap. Oh, okay. So this text, let me, let me give you a little history lesson um, uh, this is historical significance of a place called Moriah. Write in your notes now. Uh, in Genesis 22, and I, I need to, to, to share this with you. Genesis chapter 22, you read the story of Father Abraham. Father Abraham, the man of faith, he believed God was accredited in him his righteousness. Abraham has had now Isaac, his miracle son, Isaac, meaning laughter. And when his body was long past being able to produce children along with Sarah, they miraculously had a child, his name is Isaac. And then God speaks to him and says, take your son, your one and only son, and bring him to the region that I will show you. And he was going to sacrifice his only son. And it's amazing in that text, Genesis 22, how it says over and over, your one and only son, your, your, your only son, bring your only son, over and over and over. I mean, it says it so much that you can't help as a New Testament believer now tie that into the New Testament, and that's right, rightly so. You should do. So he chops the wood, and he goes with his, his, uh, his servants, and they go three days. At the end of three days, and I've preached this before, but it might be new for some of you. At the end of three days, it says, Abraham saw the place afar off. And the Hebrew word is merahuk, which I'm sure I'm mis mispronouncing. It means that he saw the place afar off. But it could, it could also mean, there's double meanings many times. It could also mean that he saw something of God off in the future. So Abraham turned to John chapter 8. John, New Testament, you got to see this. Turn to John 8. So Abraham on the third day. What day? Third day. Take his one and only son. Your only son. Take your only son, Isaac, on the third day. What day? Third day. Sees the place afar off or saw something of God afar off. Now he, he goes to sacrifice his son. He says to his servants, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, we'll, the lad and I will be back. We're going to go and sacrifice him, but we'll be back. So he's convinced that he's going to have a resurrection or something's going to happen. And this is this region called Moriah. What's it called? Moriah. In John 8, find verse 53. John 8, 53. And Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say he is your God. Verse 55. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. Wow, great preaching right there. But I do know him and keep his word. 
Verse 56, you all see that? Your father, your, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. You all see that? Come on, let's say that together. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Verse 57, the Jews said to him, you're not 50 years old. Yet you've seen Abraham. You've seen Abraham. Verse 58, Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He's referencing now all the way back to Exodus chapter 3, referencing the very name of God. He's claiming to be none other, none other than God himself is who he's claiming, the self-existent one. And it goes on to say in verse 59, they took up stones to throw at him because Jesus hid him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. The, the, the judgment for blasphemy, and blasphemy is, is basically saying that you're God or you're like God or you're partnered with, that's what Jesus was saying. He's saying, I'm God. They picked up stones to kill him and he slips through the midst of them. See, what Abraham saw afar off, I believe, was God's one and only son, just like Isaac. And there's all kinds of types and shadows that you can take from Isaac and apply to Jesus. Isaac was a type and shadow of the greater greater one to come, God's only son, who would be sacrificed, catch this, in the same exact place. It is the same place, the region of Moriah, that Jesus was then crucified. Wow! I mean, that's a, come on, somebody say wow. wow. And this region of Moriah is the exact same place that David buys this threshing floor now into our text of Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 21. Let's take a look at this text and break it down and apply it to our lives. This story is told in, in two places, here in 1 Chronicles 21, but also in 2 Samuel 24. In 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1, it says that Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census. Wow. Satan always tries to incite us to do things. He's constantly looking, constantly looking to, to steal, kill, and destroy. And, and it, it's, it's that which even Peter fell into through pride that caused Peter to become a candidate for sifting. But Jesus said, I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And then, rrr, 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 rooster. And he comes out of it and he, and he wakes up and realizes, oh man, I've totally blown it. And thank God he was restored. There's things that you can do that make you a candidate for sifting. And so David was incited by Satan. And what he does is he, is he sets a census in order. So what's so big deal about that? Well, the big deal is basically that his census was a picture of pride. He's counting all of his army to say how strong he is. And how many of you know the battle doesn't go to the many it, go, or it goes to the, the one whose the Lord's side is on. It, the Lord wins the battles, whether it be many or by few. And so as a result of his pride and a result of his national pride and making a census, there's a million plus men. And in fact, Joab is so grieved that he doesn't even count some of them. And somewhere in the midst of this, David comes to his senses and but the result of his sin was judgment on the nation. 70,000 men of Israel fell de dead from a plague. And the angel has his sword drawn to destroy Jerusalem, but David responded, and his response stopped the plague. How many of you know you can do something to stop the plague that's on our culture? You know what it is? Live for God, stand up, speak truth, vote, get involved, get involved in the process, maybe run for office. Come on, you, you can, there's many things you could do. God has called us to do it. Can you say yes? The reason, the, reason the, the nations are in so much trouble is the church was asleep in the arms of the enemy for a long time. I'm not asleep anymore. And I pray and hope that I can wake you up if you are sleeping. So it's not some little cute thing that we do on a Sunday morning. We say, well, we went, went to church today. We need to ease our conscience. No, it, this, is, this is a training ground, ground for ruling and reigning. This is a place where you learn to walk in victory, learn to walk in authority, learn to, learn to prosper and have healthy marriages and healthy kids. Learn, to, learn to, to be the head and not the tail. Learn to renew your mind, to be equipped for the work of ministry. Can you say amen? To turn the nations to God all across what God's called us to do. So he humbles himself. This angel is drawn, the sword drawn to destroy Jerusalem, but David responded and stopped the plague. How? Well, one, he humbled himself and he repents. You see that in verse 16, put on sackcloth and ashes. 
It's a picture of humility, a picture of grief. And he repents. He said, well, what's the big deal about counting? It's discounting the, the grace and the power of God that gave him victory. It's, ta- it's saying that the strength is now in my hand. Look at all the men. Look at all the money I have. Look at all the strength I have. <sighs> and the Lord's like, oh, you're jacked up now. And it released a plague. Moses counted his men, but this was different. They say the census took nine to ten months. And uh, by that time that David probably realized he had failed. And um, he buys this threshing floor of Ornan and made an altar and sacrificed burnt offerings and peace, peace offerings. What's interesting to me is that, so he buys this, this threshing floor. How many of you know what a threshing floor is? It's, it's a place where they would bring wheat in and they would then uh, take a threshing sledge, which is a farming or an agricultural instrument, to dr- drive over the top of that wheat, breaking the kernel from the, from the uh, chaff. And then as they did that, they would then take winnowing forks, which is basically a pitchfork, and they'd stick it into the, the wheat and they'd throw it up with the wind that would blow, it would blow away the chaff. And the wheat, the kernel, the good part, would fall down on that threshing floor. So it's this process of separating the good from the bad. And, uh, and maybe, that, maybe that's the first time you've ever heard that. So it's this threshing floor, and he's threshing wheat. And Ornan is a Jebusite. Now, this is interesting because the promised land was given to God's people, Joshua, in fact, to Moses, but they couldn't believe God, and so they wandered around for how many years in the desert? Forty. Forty years in the desert, their shoes didn't wear out, neither did their clothes, but they couldn't believe God. The giants were bigger than their God. But then Caleb and Joshua, it came time when a whole generation died off. It came time for Caleb and Joshua to go in. Caleb said, give me this mountain. I'm as strong as I was when he was first promised to me. I'm going to take my mountain, 80 years old. Come on, I'm going to be like that. Anybody got a spirit of Caleb in here? Come on, anybody got like a spirit of Joshua? Ah, give me my mountain. Hallelujah. And so they, they go in. What is his job? His job is to basically remove all the Canaanites from the promised land. And God said to them, I'm not going to do it over one in one night. I'm going to do it little by little so that the, the, the beasts don't overrun the land. They had game management. In the, it's God's game management in the promised land. And as you know, they take the, they tear Jericho and one king after another. They all fall. I mean, laser-guided, God-guided hailstones, killing more people than the sword did, and on and on and on, all these miraculous things. But what happens is they don't drive out all of the Canaanites, which is insane. They didn't finish the subjugation of the land. They didn't finish the conquest. They, they got the promised land, but they didn't fulfill the word that God told them, get everybody out. And these Jebusites, you know what a Jebusite means? The name Jebusite, you know what it means? It means strong polluter. So here's Ornan on this, with this threshing floor, and it's obviously his because he sells it. That is the same place that Abraham went to sacrifice his one and only son. Pretty important piece of property. His only son, his one and only son. A Jebusite. It's astounding to me that we have people endorsing transsexuals to vote in Department of Education laws, practices, and money. That would be a Jebusite. I pray they get saved. I pray they come to their senses, but it's totally demonic. We don't hate them. We hate the sin. Understand. We war not against flesh and blood. And many times people are a product of their own education and their own environment. You raised up in liberal super ultra left, don't believe God's word, don't believe anything, and you're just a slug that raised, came out of the primordial slime, and, and nobody, you know, there is no God, and then, you know, of course you're going to think it doesn't matter, that you can just be whatever you want. That's not biblical. It doesn't even stand with the, fo- the fossil record. It, it, come on, there's creation. They believe in the Big Bang. It was God. Bang. The, 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 many people believe that. They, I mean, believe it was just a bang. There was a beginning. You don't really understand. Yeah, God said, let there be light. Bang. So you have these people that are, that are in the high places of our nation. Please listen to me. They're in the high places of our country. And they're polluting it. 
And there needs to be an overthrowing. There needs to be a revolution. Please hear me. A revolution, the battle is on for thoughts and ideas. And so we need schools and school teachers and universities and people filled with the fire and the power of God by the word of the Lord, by, by God's word. And there's a lot of nonsense out there. I, I'm, I was arguing with a, with a young man. Two of them came to our church. Oh, I'm going to tell you the name of the church. It's the Church of Christ. Totally distorted teaching. Totally. And, and they do this tap dancing thing. And if you're from the Church of Christ and you're here, I'm so glad you're here. We can talk later. You keep coming. They do this tap dance thing, cut and paste of, of Scripture to come up with this theology that you have to be baptized to be saved. It is the most skewed thing. And when you pin them down on one scripture, they tap dance to go to another, to go to another, to another. But here's the thing as I've read on this, and we, we had a nice chat with them, didn't we, Mr. Barry? Well, I had another chat later on in the gym. And uh, yeah, it was awesome. They actually believe that you have, to, you have to believe on Jesus, that he died on the cross and rose again for the You have to believe that, but you have to get baptized. And until you're baptized, you're not saved. That's what they believe. And I'm like, get this. It's not just baptized. So you can't baptize me. Actually, I have to be baptized by one of their special elders. And I thought, now that's like a Christian cult, but actually it's not listed as a Christian cult. So maybe the definitions, I don't know, to me it's a little weird. And so then they go on, they go on and believe that, that actually they don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, don't believe in miracles. And I just, <laughs> it's too late. It's too late to try to preach that to me. I was dead and I got raised up. I was broken and lost and hurting. He set me free. And I'll tell you, it was before I went in the water. It's too late. And so as I'm discussing and arguing, and they're, they're here to bring reformation of the church. I mean, you go somewhere else. Don't come in here and preach that nonsense. Kick you out on your keister with the love of God. Very sincere and very sincerely deceived. There are people in high places that are distorted. They're polluting our nation. You know what has to happen? We've got to believe God that he would take us and our children and our children's children, should the Lord tarry, rise up, go into the... How many of you think it'd be great if one of your kids became a head of, of media somewhere? How many of you think it'd be great if one of our children or one of you voted for, came and bent again to be in office and, and stood against abortion and we same that, saw that thing overturned Roe versus Wade? How many of you think it'd be great if we had some anointed lawyer? I mean, that'd be an amazing thing. I mean, that's sort of unusual... But it can happen. Come on, not with God, nothing's impossible. Can you say amen? Right. How many of you think it'd be amazing if God, lawyers and doctors and teachers and professors and students and media people and political people, that's what God wants to do, not give it over to some strong polluter or Jebusite to stand in the very place that the temple would be built, polluting the land. No fear of God. No fear of God. His four boys hide. He's like, what? I'm going to keep threshing my wheat. What do you want? You know, not, no fear of the angel at all. It's a picture of our nation to me. Wow. And he does something. David does something that shifts everything. He buys a threshing floor. And he says, I will not offer to God that which costs me nothing. That which cost me what? Nothing. Releasing the power of sacrifice is the name of the message. If you will learn in your life to be a living sacrifice before the Lord, you'll release God's power. You'll release God's power. David released the power of God to stop the plague through obedience and through, through purchasing this, this threshing floor. And he declared that God's house would be built in that very same site. He wanted to build it himself, but there was too much blood on his hands. That's another message. But his son did build it, Solomon. David paid for the whole thing. David's actions not only spared the army and his people, but for the future generations and preserved really a place where even Jesus would be crucified so that you and I could be born again. Can you say amen? God is speaking to us very simply. Judgment is stopped by an act of sacrifice here on the threshing floor. And one's giving, one's sacrifice gets God's attention. Come on, say that. One's giving, one's sacrifice gets God's attention. 
Wow, Proverbs 18, 15, the gift makes way for the giver and ushers him before the presence of the great. In Philippians chapter 4, turn there with me, won't you? Philippians chapter 4, verse 18. I've received full payment and have more than enough. Everybody say more than enough, more than enough. I'm amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. So the church in Philippi sent an offering that helped significantly the Apostle Paul and sent it by this this man, Epaphroditus. He goes on to say, verse uh, 19 now, they are a fragrant offering, this is verse 18b, they're a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all of your needs according to his riches of his in glory in Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying is that your gift, your sacrifice, release provision and protection upon me. And God was going to provide and protect you as a result of it. That's amazing. And you'll see that principle throughout Scripture. We stand in a place now where God is calling the body of Christ to stand up, truly. You know, sacrifice, and sacrifice for darkness releases darkness. How many of you know that? A scripture for that. 2 Kings 3, 27. Then he took his oldest son. This is Moab and Israel. And Moab rebels against Israel and they're fighting. And Israel's winning. And the king takes his son, who had reigned in his place. This is 2 Kings 3, 27. And he offered him as a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was such great indignation against Israel, so they departed from him and returned to their own land. When this, when this, boy, when this murder of this child takes place, it releases this demonic indignation, and Israel actually is turned, the battle turns for darkness's favor. Abortion's got to stop. I said abortion's got to stop. And, 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 and I believe we're well on the way. And I believe that those sacrifices towards darkness bring an endorsement of evil in our nation. It's being broken. It's got to be broken. It's going to be broken by a strong, powerful, anointed, sacrificing, faith-filled, blood-bought church that stands up to declare the glory of God in the land of the living. It doesn't just tiptoe around. If you're offended, good. Get over yourself. You can show me in Scripture otherwise, I'll agree with you, but you can't. Sacrifice is more than money or our time or our talent. You know what it's really about? You know what it's really about? It's about the heart. Sacrifice is about the heart. You know, I said in the first service, I'll say now, you know, morning prayer is... I love morning prayer, but not like I, my flesh loves it. My flesh hates it. In fact, many a time have we gotten into, um, into low-grade arguments as I've tried to encourage my wife, even though she stayed up late night working for something, I'd try to encourage her, come on, let's go to morning prayer. Well, she was up till one in the morning or whatever, and so it just didn't work for her schedule. But I want her to come because it's easier for me if somebody would just get out of bed with me. And so I'll try to shame her, and then I have to repent. You know what I mean? Be like, come on, leaders lead. Come on, woman of God. Come on. Or I'll, I'll do funny things with my phone. I wake up before my alarm goes off, but I let it go off anyway. Amen. And I'm like, pick it up and kind of let it echo across the bed. It's a sacrifice for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sacrifice for me to go to morning prayer. I can get up and just worship God and worship Him and His goodness in my house. But there's something about getting my carcass out of bed, getting in my ice cold truck that I try to warm up, but it's a diesel, so it takes forever, and driving over here to be in morning prayer. Why? I, I just think it, it's a sacrifice physically for me. And, and I know it's a sacrifice for some of you that you're not willing to give. But I will tell you that I have had more breakthroughs and miracles because I've gone to morning prayer than, 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 than I would have had if I... Listen, I've done it. I've, I've done morning prayer, not done any morning prayer. I've mostly done it for 25 years or whatever. But there have been times where, you know, that message of delegation. I want to delegate. Can I tell you something? You can't delegate your prayer time. 
You try to delegate your prayer time. And let me just say this as a church, and for those that are, we've got pastors from all over the land, you can't, you can't delegate your prayer time for your church, sir. Pastor, if you're not there, then don't think that your one staff person can lead it and it's going to be all good. That's not how that is. I really believe the whole staff needs to be in morning, in morning prayer, and we're in it. Amen. Let's have a praise break. Amen? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Turn to Ephesians 6, and we're almost done. Don't work, this is a New Living Translation, don't work hard only when your master is watching. And then shirk, I love that word, shirk. Shirk when he isn't looking. Work hard and with gladness all the time, as though working for Christ, doing the will of God with all your hearts. How much of your heart? All your heart. Verse 8, remember the Lord will pay you for each good thing you do, whether you are slave or free. The reason our sacrifice affects things is because God is good and he wants to reward you for it. It's amazing that God asks us to do things that are sometimes difficult for us, and then after we do it, he blesses us. I was talking to one of our leaders over the weekend to hear his testimony about how God called him to leave his $70 an hour job. He didn't want to leave his $70 an hour, decent wage, $70 an hour. He didn't want to leave it. And then he keeps getting a word. Jump out in the deep, set your net down in the deep. Do it. I mean, five times the Lord spoke to him sovereignly through guest speakers and prophetic voices through his own time with the Lord, and still he couldn't do it. He's trying to sell his house. He couldn't sell his house, and things were just seemingly stalemated. When he finally said, okay, I'll do it, 15 minutes later, his house sold. When he signed his resignation, left his set, when he signed it, said, I'm done. It's a sacrifice for me. I'm just going to obey. And when he obeyed, 15 minutes later, his house sold. He said, well, that's a coincidence. Well, I have to tell you, I've got too many hundreds of stories like that to tell you that over and over and over, when you sacrifice with all your heart to obey his word, even though you feel like you're giving up something, God will reward you in this age and in the age to come. Come on, Jesus said the, 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 those who leave houses and homes and so on and so forth in, in this age will receive a hundred times more in the age to come and now, he says, and now. But it's so hard to pry things out of our hands because we don't know about sacrifice. Sacrifice releases power. And of course, the ultimate sacrifice was Jesus. Jesus laid down his life. Can you imagine being God, stepping out of eternity, stepping out of glory into the cesspool? See, it's not a cesspool. No, it's, it's beautiful, but it ain't nothing like heaven. I've heard that when people get raised from the dead and they were in heaven, they come back extremely angry. No, that's no joke. Like in Africa, there's a lot of people being raised from the dead in Africa. When they, literally, there's many stories that people have been brought back from the dead. They get up off the ground and straight fist fighting. <laughs> what are you thinking? Ah, I'm back in this hellhole. <laughs> no, that's true. That's true. That's, that's true. Because heaven's so amazing. that you, Can you imagine? You'd be like, fine. That'd be pretty depressing. And all of a sudden you're feeling your back again. You'd be like, oh, oh, what were you thinking? I remember somebody said, let's raise him from the dead. And somebody said, why would you want to do that? I mean, they're in glory. I mean, leave them alone. I think, it, I think raising the dead might be good for somebody who goes to hell. They'd be like, whoa, thanks. I want to show you, I'm going to show you a video. Uh, ushers, would you please pass out those cards? Going to give this an encouragement, an encouraging push one more time on this Sunday. And I won't be, I won't be doing this much, but I told you last week we're going to receive these giving cards towards our building project. Uh, many of you don't realize that uh, we are in a building project that is way beyond our own ability naturally. Uh, the whole project is about $20.8 million. Let me repeat that just in case you thought I was stuttering. $20.8 million. 
Good news is we have 8.2 that's already put in. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. Can you say a better hallelujah? Amen. So we need 13.5, all right? 13.5 million. Really, that's only 1,000 people giving $13,500, and we have all the money. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Say praise the Lord. You start breaking it down and realizing God's not only going to do it, he's done it already. I already see that thing done. I see thousands of people. We had not one nickel before we started. So we're just in the midst of a miracle. We're going to finish it December 2020. When? December 20. Every voice in this place, we will finish it when? I want you to watch this video, and then I'll show you something with these cards. Pastor, uh, ushers, please pass out those cards. Go ahead, let that video play. Project Vex is the name of our building project. Let me tell you how we came up with that. Uh, years ago, before we moved up here, God gave me an open vision. And in that open vision, he spoke to me and said, in the same way that there's a pipeline from the North Slope to Valdez, so there is going to be a pipeline of my power. The golden oil of Zechariah would flow to the state of Alaska, and I've called you to be a part of it. And so I didn't even know what the golden oil of Zechariah was. But when we found out, Zechariah chapter 4 is about the building of the house of God. And this golden oil of Zechariah would flow from godly leaders. And it's so profound. So there's much more to that, but that's where Project Zech comes from. You know, we've been here for, in the valley as a church, for about 20 years. God has done amazing things in pouring out His Spirit. And uh, when we got here, myself, my wife, about 13 years ago, the church is about 20 to 30 people. And since then, now, we're about 1,200. And the building we're in, <laughs> we use the entire thing seven days a week. We have uh, really used this facility, and now it's time to move. And uh, this facility will help us to continue to grow, to reach the lost, to minister to God's people, to, to reach the community and to continue to plant churches and fulfill the vision that he's given us. The vision of King's Cathedral and Chapels is to be one church in many locations, to, uh, to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ everywhere that God calls us to. And uh, years ago, it started, of course, in Maui. From there, it went out to numerous islands and has continued to expand over these now 40 years at this recording. And that's astounding. What we've seen happening here in Alaska is God creating another hub uh, of strength, uh, of leadership and resource to plant more churches and to reach more people. That is what Kings is all about to experience life with people, power, purpose. God's called us to get the harvest in, and now it's the time to do it. How can you get involved in Project Zach? There's two ways. One, no matter where you are in the world, pray for us because we're making an impact in this region of the world. And this facility is going to help us to make even a greater impact, so would you pray? Number two, number two, give. Be a part of it. You know, it's amazing to me that God allows us these opportunities to give and then and accredits it to our account that's in heaven. Be a part of it no matter where you are. Be a part of the miracle of Project Zach and see the kingdom of God come, not only to Alaska, but to the nation, not only the nation, but to the nations of the world. Why don't you put your hands together for Jesus? So let, let's, let's do this. And again, if it's your first time being with us here at a King Sunday, I mean, we're so glad that you are. Please don't feel under any compulsion to, to participate, but we also won't stop you. 
Take this card right now, and if you go ahead and look on the back, let me describe this to you as you're looking at the card. That's the easiest way to see it. There's four different columns. Weekly gift, it says, and then times 52 weeks. So if you're going to give $10 a week times 52, that's $520 over the year. Then the third column is a special gift column where if you feel that God has placed on your heart to give today or in these next few weeks towards this project, a special gift, and you can write in other amount. You know, $2,000 might be a lot for you or for me, but it's not for others. 13,500 might be a lot to give in a year, but it might not be for others. You, whatever level you're at, you say, well, I, I can't do that, but, but you know something, I've got this car, this just happened. I've got this car that's been sitting in my, in my yard. I could sell it and give that. Good. That's awesome. Think outside the box. Come on, be creative. We had somebody else say, you know, we need to do a gun auction. Come on. Auction off a gun. I'll participate in that. All right, so you buy a gun for 10 times what it's actually worth, but it goes into, the, and goes into build a building. Can you say amen? Can you say better amen? Do you know there's, there's people that are, are mas, uh, uh, masu, massage therapists? That's not a masseuse, right? That's different. Okay. A massage therapist that said, I can give a day's worth of work and, and charge people and give all the finances to the building. Had somebody else, had somebody else say, you know, I have this expensive car. I could trade it in, lessen my payments, get a lesser car, and I'm going to sow the difference into the project. We had somebody else see this video. This, this, this is for real. Did somebody else see the video? Not even a part of our church. They're not a part of our church. They called and they said, we want to be a part of this. And they sent a $2,500 check. That's how it's going to happen. You know, one person could show up to, to just take care of the whole thing. Wouldn't that be amazing? But actually would rob us from the incredible joy of sacrificing and doing our part. That To leave a legacy that years from now, should the Lord tarry, when your grandkids now have families, you could say, yeah, yep. You know, they, we, we, we built this church. My family helped build this church. We gave, and yeah, here all you kids are going to get married there. Come on, we're going to have funerals there. Going to have resurrection from the dead there. Going to see amazing things happen in that building. And I'm so grateful that it is the high ground. Did you know that? It is the high place in the valley. Well, it might not be the highest point in the valley, but it is the most, uh, the most viewed, significant to me, my opinion, commercial piece of property in the whole land. And I'm so glad that there's not, there's not a Costco there. Amen. I mean, I'm not against Costco. I'm just saying, why not a house of God? A church that never closes with 24 hour a day, seven day a week prayer. How about a place where there's signs and wonders and miracles and the good news of Jesus is preached. How about a place that's redeeming the lost and healing the sick and setting the captives free? How about that? How about we see this thing happen by the glory of God? You say, well, I don't have much. Well, I'll tell you that little becomes much in the hand of God. If you'll just trust him, do your part. Now, there's another column here, other gifts, property. We had those that have some property up Kinnick, and they said, can, I, can we give it to the church? I'm like, yeah, sure. Or you could sell it and give the proceeds. That's a biblical thing. Barnabas did that. Ananias and Sapphira didn't do so good at that. You know what they did? They said they are giving the whole thing, but they held some back, and they died as a result. That's New Testament, crazy. Wow. You can volunteer. We have a whole volunteer section. You say, I don't know about all that, I, but, I, but I can volunteer my time. Purchase supplies. We've got someone that says, well, I want to buy a pallet of sheetrock. Give vehicles, equipment, assets. We had somebody weeping, weeping and crying, handed me a bag of coins, their coin collection. I'm talking ancient coins and silver dollars. that said, I have this. I've been holding on to it. I'm going to give it into the building project. Come on, somebody. Say hallelujah. All right, so go ahead, take time, and I want you to pray. If it's your first time hearing, you go home, you take the card, you pray, you do it later. But if you're ready, we're going to go ahead and do that now. Can you say amen? I'm going to build this thing, this particular push right now. We're believing for, we need $401,000. That's the number for right now. We're going to, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So we're going to believe God for that, even today, even this morning, now this afternoon. Are your ushers, are you ready? Are you all ready? You say, why do we need the card? Let me say this one more time. We need the card because from that, 
We're not going to send Guido Sarducci with his brother and a baseball bat to get your offering. You understand? It's between you and Jesus. Ain't nobody else going to know about this between you and the Lord. But it allows us to calculate and figure out where our faith is at as a congregation to say, okay, here's where we're at. And we're going to build to that level. Can you say amen? Now, I believe that God's going to bring in more than enough. We'll be done December 2020. Can you say amen? Amen. amen? All right, and we'll let you know what the total is that's come in through these cards and commitments. I'll let you know here in a couple of weeks where exactly we're at with that. Ushers, would you come? Did you get something from God today? Come on, don't miss tonight. Don't miss tonight. It's going to be amazing. Pastor Gil, we're going to celebrate his bestowal and also Minister Rosie. Come on, let's pray. Come on, lift your, your offering, your gift up to the Lord. Father, right now, before you, we stand. And we do our part. We give what that which you have placed upon our heart. I thank you supernaturally, supernatural increase. I pray, Lord, release the favor of God, the blessing of God. Oh, I got to interrupt my own prayer. Let me just tell you, my wife and I are believing to do something weekly that we don't have. Do you understand? I don't have it. No, I have a part of it. So that part, we're going, okay, this is a sacrifice right here, but we want to do this. So, so how do you do that? We're, we're putting our sacrifice forward and they're saying, God, bring it, God. And then we're believing for God to bring that. That's our weekly thing. God supernaturally provided for us to give largely, at least large for as far as for us this morning. It's a total miracle. Come on, believe. it's called supernatural giving. Believe for it, amen? So Father, bless your people, I pray. Open up portals like my wife saw in that vision over us to see this done with shouts of grace, grace. Lord, thank you for the resources. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you for the opportunity to do something for you, even as it says in Romans. It's a reasonable thing to live as a living sacrifice, to see this place built, to see it flooded, soul saved. It's about souls, God. It's about souls. It's about reaching the lost and planting churches all over the world for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, go ahead.